watching you know just west northwest and you can kind of see that as it does pass to the south of the Cayman Islands very destructive winds coming into this region but we're not getting any confirmed reports as of yet We knew it was coming our way, but hardly anyone was prepared for the damage and devastation Hurricane Ivan left in Grand Cayman. Mr. Donovan Ebanks was the deputy chairperson of the National Hurricane Committee 10 years ago. He recalls the hours before Hurricane Ivan struck Grand Cayman and discusses the aftermath. I think if you look back, it'll, you'll find that it was the why we tend normally to only issue a watch and a warning. It's the only system that I recall in my years of being involved with the National Hurricane Committee that we actually issued an alert um, when the system was you know, more than 48 hours out. Um, it was that, just that level of concern that um, this thing just had a, an ominous amount of potential to it um, in terms of when we actually realized that we were going to get it. You know, I mean, up until, I would think up until even Friday, um, early Saturday, I mean, there was still the potential with you know, going on a slightly different course, and as you recall it, took a little um, sort of roundabout swerve around Jamaica. Um, so it was probably, I mean, the, the real realization that you were, you were going to get it was probably not until Saturday, but um, obviously all your, um, you know, all your concerns had been awakened long before that. Sunday was a, a long and, and battering day, and late on the Sunday night, we um, let some of the two of the larger fire vehicles um, head out from the fire station and head east. They were they were only able to get um, uh, up towards the top of Lynn for Pearson Highway, and there was just too many utility poles and lines and whatnot. Um, and they came back, and it was sort of like, you know, sending the first bird out from the, from the ark. And you suddenly realize that if it's that, you know, if those reports obviously are correct, then there's a potential for a lot of damage. Caribbean Utilities Company Limited, CUC, the sole provider of electricity on the island was, like most companies, badly hit by the hurricane. Although the company had developed a plan and prepared for the possibility of a hurricane hitting the Cayman Islands, there was nothing that could have prepared us for the experience of being in a Category 5 hurricane. CUC's president and CEO, Mr. Richard Hughes, speaks to the company's preparations for the hurricane. We were very prepared um, for it. I think we had covered just about uh, every eventuality from the wind speeds and and uh, you know the water level, the, the the sea surge, but you know once when you actually experience it and saw it, I don't think um, anything can prepare you for being in the middle of a Category Five hurricane. It was uh, personally uh, a lot more than I imagined it would be. Over 500 poles were down, wires broken and mangled, and vehicles flooded beyond repair. At first glance it seemed like it was all lost. Mr. Hugh recalls his initial reaction to the damage he saw the day after. It was very clear within a few hundred feet of the plant, the, the number of poles that were down, it was very clear that we had a major job ahead of us without me seeing the rest of the island. 
Getting Grand Cayman back to a sense of normalcy and calming the natural fears of residents and visitors would not be an easy task. Immediate steps needed to be taken to get key businesses and services back up and running. I want to, you must understand, was a recalibration event. I mean, none of us, no one around. I, you know, I, my mom was in her late 80s. Um, you, know, you talk to people who were that age, 80, 85, 90. I mean, it was an experience that no one in Cayman had ever had before. And so our, our mental, our abilities to imagine and project what may have happened just had never been put to, the, um, to, you know, to that level of, of uh, estimation. We just didn't have the, the background to be able to do it. I recall Kirkman and I, Kirkman Nixon, the chief fire officer at the time and the coordinator for the National Hurricane Committee. He and I headed out, I guess, eight, nine o'clock on the Monday morning and wandered through Industrial Park, um, heading in the direct, actually heading in the direction of CUC. Um, popped in the public works. I stole a dump truck because I needed a vehicle. Fortunately, someone had left a truck with keys in it, so we were able to take that. And you know, came on down to here to see what the state of play was down here. Obviously, you'd had some flooding in your engine rooms and whatnot, but structurally, you were in pretty good shape. And so, because everything is diesel powered, we were optimistic that you know, diesel equipment can reasonably survive. Knowing that the task before them was going to be mammoth, the management team agreed at its first meeting that every effort would be made to get power restored in a safe and efficient way as quickly as possible. The island and its people could not start to get back on their feet if businesses remained closed and homes were without power. The first week, um, I think, was the ultra critical. I mean, that was a major crisis. Um, there were security issues, you know, no one had power besides those with standby generators. And um, it was critical for us to get power on to the critical services in, within the first few days and certainly within the first week. And then after that, there was more um, assessment done. We covered the entire island, um, had a damage assessment, an estimate of how much time and resources were required to uh, restore power in those areas and then we went about prioritizing so that um, the, we got maximum benefit in terms of customers restored with uh, minimal effort. So that's the way we went about it. Um, we had a schedule initially for 90 days. I think the, the public thought that um, we would be lucky and certainly when we first did our assessment we thought we would be lucky to have uh, electricity throughout the island for Christmas. Um, but when we did our assessment, it came down to 90 days, and I think we completed in 75 days. So we were um, ahead of schedule and happy with that result. With the majority of the island without electricity, it was important to get a quick assessment of the damage and to get crews together to begin the cleanup and restoration process. And in order for CUC to start the rebuilding of the power plant, it was necessary to get outside assistance, human resources, and equipment. The first person I spoke to from the outside world was the uh, president and CEO of Fortis Inc., our major shareholder. And uh, this was by satellite phone. Um, I was here at the plant. And uh, the reception wasn't very good. It was coming in and out. And all I could uh, make out from him was uh, he asked the question, how bad is it, Richard? And I said, uh, it's bad as it can get, you know. Um, we need help. And uh, that was the last conversation I had with, with Stan for some time. But um, uh, within days, they had uh, a crew of uh, over 75 linemen, supervisors, technicians, um, ready to come in and uh, they had arranged a charter flight with uh, a plane, they chartered a plane from Air Canada and um, unfortunately they couldn't get in within the first few days because the airport was still not able to take um, the planes but within a week, it was a week to the day actually, the, the Saturday following, 
The plane landed uh, with assistance from the outside. In Hurricane Ivan, we had um, we were fortunate to have line crews come from uh, Provo Power in Providencial, is Belize Electricity in Belize, uh, Barbados uh, Light and Power, and also from Bermuda Electricity Company. And uh, they came in, and um, you know they would be assigned an area to do the reconstruction work uh, with their supervisor. And once they had completed that reconstruction, one of our supervisors would go and inspect it, and then we would re-energize that area. And they would move on to, to assist in other areas. With wires mangled, poles down, and a large number of transformers tossed and turned, the line crew had quite a task. Crews were organized into several groups. Line supervisors joined the transmission and distribution planners to survey the damage, while some of the line crews started clearing the downed power lines from the plant outward. The others were sent to retrieve those vehicles, which had been placed on high ground prior to the storm. Gary Whitaker and Jerry Holness were among many on the front line. When I looked out and I could see, you know, the stuff that was level, I could probably see four miles up the road, you know, and I didn't see that before. Um, I got out on the road and we had a contractor crew in, so we got in contact with those. There were so much people out on the road and started doing surveys and tried to get their equipment because they were at Frank Sound Sub into town so we could work from here, come out. We had a problem with people on the road. Um, we had to actually put on flasher, blow horns to get people out of the way. But, you know, when I looked at the damage, I said I think it'll be a fairly long time before we really recover, but I think we did pretty good overall. The next morning I came to the plant. I had to work my way down because there was no transportation. Coming here, you know, seeing the damages along the way, I knew that we were in for a big, you know, challenge to, 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 to get past, you know, what, was, what had happened. So I came to the plant and met with um, Richard, Mr. Hugh, and you know we started, you know, inquiring about what what was needed to get going. And at the height of the restoration, there were approximately four times the number of CUC's linemen on the ground assisting. To ensure everything went smoothly, the managers and certain supervisors met every day during the restoration period. Overseas crews were rotated every two to three weeks, which ensured that the high momentum was maintained. By working with our hurricane plan, we obviously knew we had to get the hospital on the airport. So we met, we got out everybody there, we followed the plan, we went out and, you know, in a couple of days time we had George on back on, which was a great achievement. But fortunately this area wasn't that damaged as the outer districts. But getting power restored safely and as quickly as possible would not be without its challenges, which included the lack of transportation and shipping delays. Manager of Materials Management Ron Parchment remembers. You may recall, uh, Florida was also hit, and Florida was a, a, a key location for getting materials, especially transmission distribution materials, uh, such as overhead conductor, transformers, pole line hardware, utility poles, etc. So there was no materials available in Florida at that time. So we had to bring in three chartered planes from Panama with con conductor, three 727s. And uh, that's when it all started and we were able to put the crews back to work. Uh, we did have some stock, such as transformers and the other items I mentioned, but not sufficient based on the devastation we had. The critical commodities uh, during the recovery stage and restoration was uh, transformers and overhead conductor. Um, our partners in, in Laurel, Mississippi, Howard worked with us. They put their crew ar working around the clock to manufacture transformers and based on our specs. They knew our specs and they, um, we chartered a vessel and we put that vessel in Tampa, that was the most strategic location and they trucked the transformers from Laurel, Mississippi to Tampa to meet our charter vessel and we had other key suppliers delivered to that vessel 
So then it all started to flow based on our needs. But transformers were the most commodity in demand at that time. As stated earlier, getting power back to the critical services and restoring power to customers' homes were key priorities for CUC. And it took lots of patience and understanding from all involved. Dana Smith and Angela McLean remember what it took to reassure customers that the crews would soon be getting to their area. When I first came back to work, it was like just the devastation of Ivan trying to get back everything back in order was it, it it was difficult it was you you had pressure coming from customers everyone coming complaining no power you couldn't get a solid answer from when power will be restored just to restore trying to get everybody back up it was very difficult and trying to hold back your emotions to and trying to deal with your personal side and cope with work it was it was very challenging there were some customers that found it very challenging and it varied across the island depending on the area they were in um, of places that were hit hard, hardest um, but the communication as in how we communicated with the field workers and you know to be able to communicate back to our customers we were using radios and so forth so we did have some sort of um, communication avenue opened um, but it as Angie said, it was very challenging. As was the case with many persons on the island, a number of CUC employees lost their homes or had to deal with significant damage to their properties. We prepared as best we could by stacking items on cupboards, beds and counters. We watched as the water began rising outside. It covered our porch and then it was up to our windows. The back door gave in to the pressure and we could do nothing to hold back the flow. It sounded like a river running through our house as we took shelter in the attic. It was up to four feet in a few hours and then crested at five feet three inches. I measured the watermark on our wall sometime afterwards. It was the longest day ever in our attic, tired of battling the elements and waiting for help and the storm to blow over. We could literally hear the house being torn apart as the shingles and guttering peeled away with the wind. Our ceiling sheetrock cracked as the pressure in the house slowly built up and the winds pummeled the doors and boarded windows. One by one, the windows shattered or were loosened by flying debris. The water outside rose quickly and we soon had nearly a foot inside as it came through the plumbing and under the doors. We jumped on our countertops and table and watched with disbelief as the water destroyed everything. It was an experience I will never forget, truly horrifying. At least six, six feet of salt water in the house. Um, the computer had moved from the computer room into the sitting room. The fridge was lying across the floor, which was standing, it was just lying across the floor. The shoes that were in the front room was way in the back room, outside, actually outside, floating in the water. Rising waist deep water was our biggest concern. It started coming through the sides and under the doors and the drain in the bathtub and sinks. We piled up on the kitchen counters looking to keep dry. We could hear the zinc sheets on the roof being peeled away to the point where we could look up and see the sky. Luckily, the only part of the roof and ceiling that stayed intact was directly above the kitchen, so we were safe for now. We made our way to the garage through the receding waters. The cars were flooded, but we soaked up the standing water and covered the seat. What a relief it was to finally rest our weary bodies on soft seats. Five hours of bailing water was my sole task that fateful Sunday. As the storm surge came in, I watched in shock as my neighbor's car slowly disappeared beneath the murky water. It was hard to believe how quickly the water was rising outside. It had to be nearly six feet deep. In no time at all, I had four inches of water throughout my downstairs as the water seeped in under the front door and through the dryer vent in the utility room. Bailing and prayer were the only things keeping the water from rising inside my apartment. It's hard to relive what we experienced. Yet these and many other employees showed up for work, 
ready to make whatever contribution they could to get their company and country up and running. What can I do to help? was the question they asked. I think um, CUC staff and, uh, you know, I can't speak for other electric utilities, but certainly CUC staff over the years have a sense of uh, duty to serve 24 hours and do whatever it takes to get the power on. So um, I, I, I must say they, they responded extremely well. Um, some had their own personal challenges with losing their homes and um, you know, had, uh, they had to relocate. We, we assisted by finding, um, uh, for some of them that required it, uh, hotel rooms. And um, it, was, it was a very difficult time for a lot of the staff, but they, they responded, responded very well. The company set up a kitchen on location to ensure that there were hot meals for the crews and made other amenities available to employees and their families. Marlene Galbraith and Emily Pearson remember. I came into CUC and when I saw what happened here, that was another thing I had to endure. We decided we're gonna cook and all these sort of things for the people that's working because there was nowhere to get food. So we had to get a police permission to come in like four o'clock in the morning to be on the road at that time because there was a curfew. And we started to come in four. When on the road coming into town, you, you didn't know where you were. It was a shock coming out that time of the morning. It was all dark when you reached by Jose. I said, you didn't know where to go. Anyway, go on. Every morning you'd come down four o'clock making porridge and food and whatever for the staff that's working. Those guys doing the road, doing the on the road to get people connected. Well, the number one priority for us, for me, was um, taking care of our staff um, by assi um, assessing to see what kind of damage each employee had. Um, also, um, we were giving out loans for employees who had damage to their houses, who needed generators, salary advances, giving them accommodations if necessary, took employees to the doctor who needed to go who were hurt, and CNB was also giving out, or at, um, we had some terms and conditions with CNB. Um, CUC was guaranteeing loans for them for car loans. Block by block, pole by pole, wire by wire, and the beautiful sounds of the engines revving again. CUC and Grand Cayman were rebuilt and restored. You know, one of the things that um, all of us who are have an interest in this area have to do is to try to keep reminding people because there's obviously the natural tendency for our awareness to, to gradually wear off. Um, there are more, you know, people who were, there, we have somewhat of a, a transient society, we get people here who would never experienced it. Um, so, you know, that's, it's good to um, remind people and I'm hoping that over the next month or so, you know, a lot of that rather shocking, I wouldn't call it gory, but shocking um, footage of the devastation gets, you know, redistributed in photos and videos and, and, and people are reminded that, you know, when you hear of heart systems, this is the potential of what they can do. Um, we'll just assume that it may happen somewhere else, it can happen here too. Ten years later, some wonder, did Ivan really happen? Yes, it did. And what did we learn as a result of the experience? I think Ivan was a, a great educator in the fact that um, you know, we can be seriously, seriously, physically. Um, knocked around by a hurricane. Um, we'd never seen that amount of damage, you know. You know we'd had systems come by, we'd had Gilbert and 88 come by and rough, you know, brush us up a bit. But Ivan really showed us that, you know, we can be, we can be taken and shaken and, and kind of put in a pile of rubble too. Um, I think there was also a lesson that we can survive a hurricane. There's really no reason in, in today's society with the type of facilities we have, with the warnings we get, there's really no reason people get injured, there's no reason for anybody to get killed. So I mean, I think that was a, a confidence builder in that regard. As a company, um, we have strengthened, uh, I think, our relations um, overseas with suppliers. So, um, you know, we, uh, 
a, a lot, I mean, it confirmed, the hurricane confirmed to us what we knew um, and what we had uh, devised as a plan of re resiliency coming out of the uh, threat, the near miss we had with um, Hurricane Gilbert. And I think there was a study done at the time that for a Cat 5, we would see around eight and a half uh, to 10 feet um, tidal surge. So we had built everything since um, 1988 above uh, the floodplain, but there are little things you forget, like our small vehicles. Um, you know, we parked as many of those as we could at high ground, but we lost a lot of small vehicles. So initially we were scrambling for transportation. And um, so we have, a, we have a better plan for, for that now. Um, and uh, I think uh, the communications went, went fairly well, as, so we learned some lessons there and, and estimating how long it will take. I think it's very important to keep communicating with the public and um, setting expectations and um, you know, um, reassuring them that there is a plan and schedule and we are making progress along that plan. Prior to Hurricane Ivan, we had started building our transmission uh, systems out of concrete poles and indoor substations and um, those, uh, if, if you would recall, on the south coast from Bodden Town to, to Frank Sound, I mean there was utter devastation. The trees were just about all, all leaves were gone anyway and uh, most of the trees and um, but the thing that was standing was, was, you know, our concrete poles and so they stood up extremely well and uh, for our transmission system that is a standard today. And um, we have built uh, since then another line from Frank Sound to Rum Point, you know, with using the concrete pole. So that will serve us well in the future should we have another major hurricane. In September 2004, Hurricane Ivan came and left behind a trail of destruction, despair, and anxiety. No water, no electricity. In the aftermath, spirits were revived, hope was renewed. New friendships were made and communities came together to rebuild. Ivan, I think, brought out the best in a lot of people. It, you know, it, it put a lot of us through experiences that we would never want to, to have again. But um, I think it, you know, it, it provided an opportunity for a lot of people to, to demonstrate abilities, um, both in, in, in how they interact with other people and how they share and how they care, and also in how they perform. Um, people perform well above what we would have expected of them. Take a look around and you may never know that Ivan hurtled through Grand Cayman with wind speeds of 150 miles per hour. Those who experienced Ivan won't forget September 11th and 12th, 2004. Neither will CUC and its employees. We have recovered since Ivan. We rebuilt since Ivan. We are stronger since Ivan. We have survived Ivan. On this 10th anniversary I think it's uh, something they can look back on and be very proud um, of how they serve this uh, company and the country um, as a whole. <laughs>